Father, we just pray that um, that goodness and mercy uh, would bring stillness to our hearts. Father, as we look at uh, Psalm 95 today, we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would open our eyes and give us understanding and open our ears to hear what you are saying to us. Give us hearts to obey. Give us hearts to yield to you today. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that, Leone. We're going to have a look at Psalm 95 today. And uh, Abigail uh, beautifully read the first part of that psalm earlier as we started. Um, and it's all about uh, magnifying God. And then about halfway through when you get to verse 7 of this psalm, it actually turns and becomes really quite serious. And so Abigail is now going to read the second half of that psalm to us. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof that they had seen my work for 40 years. I loafed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So, as we read Psalm 95, verse uh, 6 says, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. And then it says, and this is our key verse today, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as in the days at Massa in the wilderness. And that's the verse. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And we find that in Hebrews um, uh, 4. We find it in Hebrews 6. Um, it's a, 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 a tremendous verse, really. And it speaks to us very personally today. As we hear his voice, what do we do with our hearts today? So what was the situation where this um, th this uh, instruction, this warning was given? Um, it says in, in Psalms 95, um, uh, it talks about, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah. What happened at Meribah? Well, what happened at Meribah was that this was the incident where Moses um, struck the rock uh, twice with his staff at God's instruction. And water supernaturally came out of that rock. And why did that happen? Well, the children of Israel, as usual, and there are at least 12 incidents of their sins in the books of Exodus, Deuteronomy, Numbers, um, that there was an accumulation of issues that God had with the children of Israel. And one was they were always complaining and they would not trust that God could look after them. And so in Numbers 20, verses 4 to 5, it says, Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness, that we should die here, both we and our cattle? And why have you made us come out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It's no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. So it's understandable that they might say, Moses, where's the water coming from? But the nature of their complaint was far worse than that. In fact, it was so bad that it caused Moses, for the first time that we know, to really lose his temper. He really lost it this time. Now, don't forget that Moses was called in the, the Bible the meekest man on earth. And yet he really boiled over at this point. And in verse 10 of Numbers 20, he said, Hear now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock of his staff twice. Not once as God had instructed him, but twice. And water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their livestock. So God was faithful. He didn't let them die, but he was paying attention to what was going on in their hearts. 
And in Moses, Moses' heart was wrong. He actually, for the first time, he took the place of a judge rather than defending the children of Israel. He said, you hear now, you rebels. We hadn't had that tone from Moses before. And as well as that, he was very angry. And when we are angry, we attempted to do things, aren't we? And so rather than hit the rock once, he struck it twice. And God was not pleased. Psalm 95, verse 10 to 11, goes on and it says, For 40 years I loathed that generation. Now that word loathe is a very big word, isn't it? If you really loathe something, do you, know, do you have a food that you loathe? What food do you really not like? I remember when I was at school in Derbyshire, as it happens, they fed us butter beans, very mushy butter beans, and sometimes I think not very good butter beans. And so I had an aversion to butter beans. I loathe butter beans. Butter beans made me sick. That's the feeling that God had over Israel's sin. He said, it says, I loathed that generation, because they sinned again and again and again against him who had been so generous to them. And they went astray in their hearts. And so what we're talking about this morning again is our heart has to turn in order for us to sin. And therefore I swore in my wrath, and here is the consequence of what they did, they will not enter my rest. And again, that's repeated through scripture. What was this rest that they were not allowed into? Well, this rest was the promised land. Do you remember that um, that, that Moses promised them a land that was flowing with milk and honey, that had streams of water, a beautiful land where they would have rest from their enemies? And God said, I'm sorry, you're not going in. And this led to a very sad incident when one day Moses went up a hill It was called Mount Nemo. Um, It was opposite Jericho. And from that high mountain in the country of Jordan, he could look over the Jordan Valley to the beautiful plains of Israel and the mountains beyond. It was an amazing view. And God said to him, Moses, you're not going in. Because of what you did at that time, I'm not letting you in. And Moses thought this was unfair. And God said to him, no, speak to me no more about this matter. And God wouldn't let him get it go in because Israel had stirred up his anger and he'd overstepped the mark. And really, it's a warning to us that God hates sin and he takes sin seriously. But thank God for his mercy. As we'll see, God is very merciful to us. So what is the promised land for us? What does it mean for us to enter his rest in Hebrews 4, entering his rest? Well, I believe that it's the spirit-filled life. You see, Jesus said, as I am, so are you in the world. And God had planned that we would be like Jesus in this world, that we would be filled with the fruit of the Holy Spirit, that we would be joyful, that we would have peace, that we would be full of love, that we would be patient people, kind people, gentle people, Faithful people, people that did what they said, people that wouldn't let other people down, people with self-control. And this was the character of Jesus given to us by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit-filled life. And more than that, uh, on the day of Pentecost, God poured out his Spirit upon them with flames of fire, and they were anointed to preach the gospel. They were given the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They spoke in tongues. They prophesied. They healed the sick. And God wants us to be filled with the Spirit, with that same fire, that we may have power to be his witnesses. But even more than that, and maybe you'd like to think about how this applies to you. In Romans 12, it talks about the differing gifts of the Spirit. It says in Romans 12, verse 6, having gifts that are different, that differ according to the grace given to us. You see, God gave George Muller grace to build an orphanage. God gave Hudson Taylor grace to start the China Inland Mission. God's given Phil is uh, uh, pulling this all together this morning, a gift for the things that he does. But what is the gift that God has given you? What are the gifts that he wants you to use? Are you going to stay 
in the wilderness or are you going to move into the promised land of his calling? What is the spirit saying to you? Gifts that differ, prophecy, serving, teaching, encouragement, generosity. What a thing that is at this time. And I know people are going around, knocking on their neighbor's door at this time, doing their shopping for them, helping them out. Many people who are ringing, lonely people, talking to them, taking uh, food around, serving in all sorts of, of, of generosity. It's a great and a wonderful gift. One who leads with zeal. If God has called you to lead with children, with teenagers, uh, with the music, in all sorts of different ways in the church, we should do that with zeal. But let's not hold back. George Muller said, as Joe mentioned, God does not expect everybody to open an orphanage, but God has something for everyone to do. So, how do we get into this promised land? How can you and I enter into this land? In Hebrews 4 verse 3, it says, For we who have believed enter that rest. So faith, what is faith? It's a hard word, isn't it? But to me, whenever I think of faith, I very often just replace that word in the Bible by trust. And God is always testing us. How much do we trust him? I would say that most of the trials in my life have boiled down to the fact, not what would I do, but how much would I trust God? Hebrews 4, 6 says how, how we miss out on the promised land. Good news came to us to just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. So unbelief stops us from going into God's purposes for our life. Do you remember the story of, the, uh, of, of Joshua and Caleb and the 12 spies that were sent out into the land? The 12 went out, and the 12 came back. They all had seen the same thing, but that he had, they had a different report. They all reported the milk and honey. They came back with these massive grapes. They said, it's a good land. It's a good a land flowing with milk and honey. But 10 of them said, but there are giants in the land. So we're not going. But Joshua and Caleb, they said, if the Lord is pleased with us, if the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into the land. So the good news is that it isn't me trying to get in. It's me actually putting my trust in God that he will bring us into these things. Hebrews 4 verse 9 says, So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. I wonder what that rest is, but it's, it's out there for us. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. What is your Sabbath rest? I don't believe it's just putting your feet up. And it says, for whoever has entered God's rest has rested also from his works, just as God did from his. So the message here is it's not all about my efforts. Do you remember George Muller? He made an effort every morning to get his soul happy in the Lord. And then he went about his daily work with all his might, all his strength. First of all, he made sure that he was in a good place with God before he even did his daily work. How do we miss out on this? Hebrews 4, 6. Since therefore it remains for some to enter in, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter. Why? Because of disobedience. God is looking for us to obey. As we hear his voice, he is looking to us to obey him. And then a very unusual word crops up that we wouldn't expect at this time. We're talking about entering rest. And yet in verse 11 of Hebrews 4, it says, let us therefore strive. Oh, let's roll up our sleeves. Let's work hard at this. Let's strive. But I thought there wasn't strife in the Christian life. Well, what does it say? Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. So we have to make an effort to get into this rest. What does this involve? I've got a, a found a letter, Joe found a letter 
um, online, which was this letter that George Muller wrote to uh, Hudson Taylor. And there's a copy of it here, just in the background of the next slide that we're going to show you. George Muller's letter to Hudson Taylor. And this is what he said in that letter, rather beautiful. No amount of work can make up for the neglect of meditation in the Holy Scriptures and for the neglect of prayer. Nothing can make up for these two things. So I'm making it really simple. The Bible makes it really simple. There are two things we need to enter that rest. This is the way that, Ju that Hudson Taylor went into the rest. This is the way that George Muller entered the rest through meditation on the Holy Scriptures and prayer. Those were the two things. It goes on in, in verse 12 of Hebrews, for the word of God. Now, the word word here is often translated in two different ways in the original Greek. One is logos, and that usually means um, a message, a document, um, and rhema, which often means a spoken word, a short word, that which comes out of the mouth. And this is Logos, so it's actually more talking about the whole message, in fact, the whole Bible. And it says, for the word of God is living, active, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing between piercing, it says, to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. I want to encourage you to, to start reading the Bible the way that Job has been talking to you, taking a verse at a time, letting it speak to you, letting it deal with you, taking that prayer, those words back to God in prayer. And as you do, you'll find the word beginning to pierce you, to show you actually what your intention was when you did something. And then it says, and no creature is hidden from his side, but all are naked before the eyes of him who, of whom we must give an account. Do you know, one day we are all going to give an account to God of what we've done. That's what the Bible says. I want to give a good account. I'm sure there are many things in my life I wouldn't give a particularly good account. But from here on, why don't we give a, a good account to God of our lives? Because to him, as we pray, we are naked before God. There is no pretense. Other people we can pretend to, we can't pretend to God. We are naked before him. And now a little bit of good news for you. In Hebrews 4.15, as we come to the end, it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. You see, God doesn't, isn't looking for our strengths. He's not looking for our human abilities. He will take our weaknesses and work with those if we will bring our weaknesses honestly to him. Say, God, I believe you're calling me to this. I believe you're calling me to give up this job and to do this. I'm, I believe you're calling me to take on this challenge, maybe to extend my life, to build a relationship with somebody else, maybe to reach out in a different way, maybe some area of calling. But God, I don't feel up to it. Good response because God will take that weakness and turn it into strength. Because the next verse says, Therefore, let us with confidence draw near. This is our final verse this morning. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy. So we say we can't do this, God, but we are coming to you to receive the mercy, to receive the grace to receive the power to do this thing. So I want to just take us back finally to that thought that we began. Let me see if I can find it. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your patience with us as human beings. Thank you for your kindness that you allow us to join you in your purposes. Thank you, Lord, that you have something for each one of us to do. 
Father, you are speaking to every one of us every day. Would you let us hear your word through the scriptures? Would you give us a heart and an appetite to read the Bible? Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.